It is 2.01. We need to get started. Welcome to the first, what's the matter? Oh, hello, hello. The first uh, annual, we don't know. We'll see how it goes today. Um, seminar on why I believe Reverend Moon, Sun Myung Moon, is the second coming of Christ. My name is Carrie Williams. I will be your MC. Everybody in the room, please have a seat. In the back, please have a seat. We welcome your participation. Um, we have some wonderful speakers today who combine have been followers of Reverend Moon for over 200 years, okay. <laughs> All right, no, they don't, do they? Um, please join me in prayer uh, before we begin. Our most beloved Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you so very much, Father, for your, your love, which is like the sunshine, Father. It's always there. You're always there. You're always giving to us. You're always encouraging us. Father, thank you for the 10,000 crosses that you went for our sake, not just for all of humankind, though surely it was, but, Father, for me, so I could be rescued from hell. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit can guide this meeting here today, that you will be with each of the speakers. Thank you for their um, willingness to stand up and to testify. And um, I just really pray, Father, that this can be a blessing and we can leave today enriched and closer to you and closer to Christ. I report this in the name of all the blessed central families here in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and Aju. All righty. So as we get started, just to let you know how things are going to roll, uh, we have six speakers. Um, we will have the first three. It will be Jim Stevens, Regis Hanna, and Gideon Rauchy. And then we will have you submit any questions uh, right there in that little plastic box provided. Um, we will take a short 10-minute break. Then we will have questions and answers. And then the second session uh, will be speakers by Richard Panzer, Miho Panzer, and Tim Elder. And I apologize. I did not have Miho's name up there in the advertisement. Um, so my... Sincere apology to Miho because uh, her perspective, as you will see, is uh, is quite remarkable. All righty, without any further ado, um, let's welcome Mr. Jim Stevens. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, a little earlier, when Carrie was praying uh, with the group of us that are going to speak, I started thinking about. How did I get here? And uh, I was reminded that I am a chosen person. God chose me. <laughs> and I remembered that I lived in Chicago. I went to Northwestern University. But for even a couple of years before I hitchhiked to California and met the church, I had been thinking about going to California. So I, I believe that God was putting those thoughts in my mind uh, for a couple of years before I acted on it. And I would suggest that each one of you is also a chosen person, or you wouldn't be here. And that, uh, you think about that. I, I think God chooses everybody, but we each have, you know, certain responsibilities and uh, those of us here now have, of course, we know lots of responsibilities. So here, this is a young man, not quite 24 years old, and uh, he was searching for good vibes. So he hitchhiked out to California in 1973, and met a lot of people along the way, had lots of experiences, was backpacking, went and walked across the campus on Berkeley and was grabbed by a young lady and taken over for dinner. And uh, he heard the principles of education and eventually heard the divine principle. And the first time that I heard the principle, I had three amazing experiences. <clears throat> three 
three of the lectures really stuck out in my mind from that beginning time. And each one of us, I think, who's an uh, elder member remembers certain parts of the principle that just really struck their, their mind and their heart. But for me, it was these three. The nature of God. When I heard the explanation of God's nature, being male and female, internal and external, it was like these, these light bulbs going off. I said, I always knew that. How come nobody ever told me that before? Now I can believe in God. That was my experience. It was like falling off a chair in realization. Uh, that was my first real deep experience with the principle. Second, when they gave the life of Jesus. In my own life, I tried to do a lot of good things. And people ridiculed me. And I, had a, you know, I got a lot of criticism, a lot of struggle with people when I was trying to organize things. <clears throat> so I knew in my heart that that was the life of Jesus. <clears throat> the really, really good man who tried his best and he got killed for it. And I was so moved. I went down to dinner and everybody was happy and talking. And I could not eat my dinner. I was so moved by the life of Jesus. And I knew it was true. I just, there was no doubt in my mind. That was the second thing that was so deep for me. So I'm, I'm experiencing the principle that's true. I never heard about Reverend Moon at that point. And then when I heard the lecture on the second coming, I thought, my reaction was, well, he's here. Let's go find this guy. I remember that very clearly. Let's go find this guy. He's over in Korea somewhere. Um, and then it was... Uh, like a day later, I was in the bedroom, and there was a couple of brothers having a discussion. And one of the brothers said, I just can't believe Reverend Moon is the Messiah. Bing, oh, we found him already. <laughs> that was my experience. So each person has their own course, their own way to go. I decided, okay, I'm going to try this out. I'll move in for 40 days. That's what they ask at that time. And see what it's like after 40 days. So this was the transformation that took place. My mother thought I was brainwashed after she saw me. <laughs> That's right. So after 40 days, I never even thought about leaving. I kept re-experiencing the truth. So... My conclusion, my key point for all of you is that <clears throat> I, I was fortunate because I became a state leader after about oh, what was it, three or four years, and I had to teach the principal. And every time I taught the principal, I learned something newer and deeper about the principal and about God. So many times I had the... Ex I mean, I remember this one workshop I was giving, a seven-day workshop, I was teaching... Uh, the three blessings. And we had chalkboards at that time. And I turned around the chalkboard and I said, Holy Father, Heavenly Father, help me. <laughs> I don't understand this. How to teach this to these people, right? And it just downloaded in my brain all of this information. What incredible, incredible um, realization of what God was trying to create through the three blessings. And I have a whole lecture I'd love to give you on that, but it's, it's, joy, it's just the incredible joy at every level. Our relationship with God is meant to be minute by minute joy. And our relationship between our spouses, our, our families, our children, our grandchildren, our great grandchildren just keeps getting bigger, greater and greater love and joy forever. And the the third blessing, our relationship with the world around us, with well, our mission in life. Everybody has unique gifts and abilities to give, and their passions in life is what makes everything such a beautiful, beautiful kingdom. So not just that, but over and over again, as I taught the principle, I learned how deep. I remember a prayer I had about growth. Help me understand growth, Heavenly Father, so I can teach this. And it was like this... 
this scenario in front of me like presented. Well, how about this? Suppose a husband and wife decide to have a baby and then they make love and the next day the baby's born. How would that be? No growth. Just instantaneous. <laughs> well, what if the child was five years old the next day after you made love? Is that, how's that feel? <laughs> that's not loving. That's not artistic, right? There's no joy. You, you missed everything. <laughs> God gives us growth because it's an expression of his love. So as I taught the principle, I learned the principle. So I really encourage you guys, teach the principle. So all right, okay. So with the seven minutes I've got left, <clears throat> I've given myself, I'm going to make a mad dash through the table of contents of the divine principle. But I want you to note that true father was 25 years old when he had discovered all of this divine principle, the whole book, all that information. Think about that. If you just discover one of these points in your whole life. When I joined the church, I was 24. And I graduated the top of my class. But I didn't know any of this stuff. I was looking for it. And he had already, at, the, at my age, he had discovered all this. Think about When you were 25, what have you discovered? <laughs> you know, think of, this is the truth of the universe. And he had discovered it by the time he was 25 years old. So what we have in the, the outline is just the outline. It's the skeleton of what Father knew at that age. To understand such truth at any age, such a person would be one person in centuries. An easy conclusion is he's the returning Christ. <clears throat> and I came across this, amazingly, this was on the internet. This, in a way... In a way, then, the divine principle, this new revelation, is the documentary of my life. It's my own life experience. <clears throat> the divine principle is in me, and I am in the divine principle. When I read that, I thought of this quote. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So, Divine Principle book, list of the chapters. Principle of creation, dual characteristics. How many of you really spent time to understand the dual characteristics? Male, female, for example. I mean, there are books and books and books about male-female relationships. Right? All this is from God. True Father understood so much of this. The purpose of creation, I talked about how everything was, every level, relationship with God, relationship with each other, everything was meant to be joy. The growing period, I mentioned that as one of my experiences in, in understanding God's heart and what he was creating. How about this, the section on spirit world and, and physical world. What, when I heard this lecture, I, I thought, wow, I just like, more than doubled my understanding of the universe. I'd only been aware of the physical world. Now to think about both worlds, it's, it's like blows the top off your head. How much is out there? How much more there is to the world and to life than we were aware of? I grabbed a lot of these from the, the green book, the level four book, put them in here. But vitality elements, how we grow spiritually, all of this understanding that Father came up with. Father realized and was put it, just if you understood this part, if you could explain spirit world to people, you're the Messiah, I would say. <laughs> and the fall, think about what Father brought with the understanding of the fall. An explanation of in the Bible, you know, the two trees, the serpent in the garden, all of that. And how did it happen? Oh my gosh, understanding the motivation and the process of the fall. How deep is that? Understanding the four fallen natures. So many times this was so valuable to me in looking. How do you 
First fallen nature, not taking God's point of view. How we fell away so much because of that. The purpose of the Messiah, what is he supposed to do? Most people don't know what is the purpose of the Messiah. Oh my gosh. The last days, what's going to happen? What is the meaning of all those things in the Bible about the stars falling from heaven and all of that? Father understood all that. Resurrection, oh my gosh. Life and death. All of that is explained. Predestination. Man's portion of responsibility. The second king was talking about that today. Christology. What is the nature of Christ? He gave us all this an understanding. Overview of history. The foundation to receive the Messiah. What is the purpose of all of this human history? The whole purpose. What are we trying to get out of the Bible? It's the foundation for the Messiah. <laughs> Why do we have history repeating itself? For the Messiah. That's everything. How do you meet the Messiah in your life? You make the foundation for the Messiah. That's how you meet the Messiah. It's all right there. Oh, my gosh. Adam's family, Noah's family. How did he figure out all this stuff? How did he understand what went on in Adam's family, in Noah's family? The arcs. <laughs> I mean, it just goes crazy. Where you start to think about all of this information. Abraham's family, the cutting of the, the offering, and the failure that cost 400 years. Oh my God, it's 400 years of slavery because he didn't cut the dove and the pigeon? Ow, we're <laughs> pretty serious what's going on here. Moses, here's another whole, you know, the, the tablets and the. Uh, 40 years in the wilderness, eating manna and quail every day. All of that. And Jesus, what happened in Jesus' life? What was the dispensation of the cross? John the Baptist, who knew? John the Baptist blew it. We got to be careful. We don't make John's mistake. How many people have we seen that made John the Baptist's mistake? dispensational time identity, the repeat of history. Right? What's going on here? He's trying to build the foundation to receive the Messiah. And, you know, God likes kingdoms. He likes to build everything centered on a, ki on a king. It's a true family, right? But if there's failure, he's got to divide it. And then if you don't, don't come back together again, then you've got to go into suffering and slavery and Babylon or whatever. Over and over again, we understand what God was doing because of true father. And the second coming, how, when, and where? Hello. <laughs> well, if all the rest of that's true, this is true too. You got to assume that if he figured all the rest of that out, if he understood all that, he understood this too. So we can say, okay, how? How? He's coming as a man. When? 1920. He was born. Where? In Korea. Again, learn the divine principle. Relate with the divine principle. Part by part. You try and swallow the whole thing at one time. You can't do it. But if you teach lectures, if you, if you study one part and try to understand it and you pray about it, ask God your questions. He can answer you. This is what I believe. This is my connection. This is why I can always go back. It's just like everybody goes, you know, go back to the Bible. Go back to the divine principle. And you'll know who Father is. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Jim. Let's give him another round of applause. So if you have questions, you may want to like jot something down so we can follow up during the question and answer session. Um, without any further ado, let us welcome up our next speaker, Dr. Regis Hanna. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Jim is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, I wrote mine out so you have something to take with you, but I only have 20 copies. So if you're a couple, if you could just take one, 
Um, I don't know who can pass out. Yeah, maybe somebody else can pass these. Volunteer, somebody, please. Thank you. Not just that. Uh, like Jim, uh, just to give a little background, since an early age, um, I had had spiritual experiences, which I did not talk about with anybody because um, uh, there were some issues in my family. I knew that would not be that would not be welcome. But I was experiencing the spiritual world as a child, um, and I didn't understand these experiences. One of the experiences that I had was that I was as I became a teenager, and that it got more and more intense as I got into college. I kept receiving, "You have a mission. You have a mission." And the reality is my life was, was becoming very, very difficult at Georgetown. I'd been, the suffering just increased. And uh, I, uh, Georgetown was a great school, but I was a miserable student, horrible student. I was so bad, they kicked me out for my grades. And at that time, if you got kicked out of college for your grades, then you went to Vietnam. So this was a very serious situation. Um, I had a meeting with the dean and managed to beg my way to have one last chance. So I said to God, I said, you keep telling me I have this mission. I must be either crazy or you have to tell me what the mission is. So I'm going to, as they say in, in, in Christianity, I'm going to lay a fleece. Either you tell me what my mission is by my 21st birthday, or I am going to commit myself to St. Elizabeth's Mental Hospital because I must be nuts. I was that serious. I was deadly serious. Now, little known to me, the person who witnessed to me worked at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in the intake department. She was one of two social workers, and they were both Moonies. So God kind of had me coming and going. You know, either way, I was surrounded. My name, Regis, means of or belonging to the king. And I was a uh, 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 wonderful surprise, my mother says. So I was the third child. So, you know, I feel like my life was, was very much destined for this purpose. Um, I was witness to, uh, some of you may have heard of Jean Dixon. She was a, a popular psychic uh, back then. Um, I had visions when I went to see her. God told me, everything's going to be fine. And I met my spiritual mother. I came to the lectures. I never went to lectures off campus. I just didn't do that. I just didn't do that. I went, um, and when I, I was there in the room, probably with 10 people, and I began hearing this, and then spirit will just descend. This, this is the highest truth in the world. This is it. This, I, I almost couldn't hear the lecture from, from Philip because the, 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 the sound coming inside of my head just kept coming. This is it. This is it. This is it. So I, was, I still have the notes I wrote on a, on a file card, you know, from that time. It was, it was so intense. At one point, I think Philip looked at me and said, you really understand this, don't you? And I was like, <laughs> I mean, doesn't everybody? So um, I ended up hearing a conclusion on my 21st birthday God is great. God is faithful. He is good. He fulfilled. And um, that night I went to a party with um, some other people, and uh, I realized this was my chance to change my life, and I knew I needed to change my life very, very much. So it was very clear. Um, the members at that time were very surprised because they hadn't had a new member in a number of years, and they were very surprised that I wanted to just move in immediately. So um, you'll see on the, on the sheet... Uh, some points that I've made. I want to start with the conclusion, the summary on the last page. Or the, the, the second and third pages. Um, <clears throat> divine principle is, is uh, and Jim went through it in a, in a summary way. Divine principle is not easy to understand. And I found it very difficult. I don't, mean, I don't say this to challenge you. Um, I just say this, don't be frustrated when you start, you know, looking at it. 
if you find things that are difficult to understand. I remember certain things like origin division union process. I, I probably didn't understand it for 10 or 15 years. Uh, eventually what I've done is I, I read through Divine Principle out loud 235 times. That's the times that I counted and wrote down the dates. But back in the day, what we did was we never went anywhere without taking our Divine Principle book and we would read it out loud in the car when we were out on an errand. So we were constantly saturating ourselves in the truth. Divine Principle is not easy. I took comfort in the fact that one member at that time, she had been full scholarship to Stanford. And she said Divine Principle was the hardest thing she ever understood, she ever studied. So um, it's a very high level truth. Not everybody can understand it. So you just have to work at it. You just have to work at it. But to me, um, in, in, some, in the summary section, you'll see on the, the second page, only somebody with a very intimate relationship with God could find a formula that assembles all the key figures and events from Adam to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from Adam, Isaac, and Jacob to Jesus, and from Jesus until today with numerical periods, perfectly lining up, repeating three parallel events into one coherent theory. Divine principles are rational theory that explains how God worked in history in the past and is working today. While defining the human portion of responsibility, explaining exactly what we need to do today as individuals, families, etc., to fulfill God's ideal of creation. Divine principle states that we need an explanation of God and his will that unifies religion and science. In other words, no more, um, it's a mystery, my son. You just have to accept it. Which is what I got from the Catholic Church when I asked questions. Georgetown University, Jesuit University, asking my professors questions. They didn't know. They didn't know. So the unity of science and religion, logical explanation to me is so powerful. Divine Principles Theory of History states there are two parts, a central and a peripheral history. And God works in the central history. There are other theories of history out there. Uh, Toynbee said there are between 21 and 26 great civilizations in history. Each one is founded upon a certain ethical pattern, certain ethical or values foundation or religious foundation. But he didn't explain where history is headed or why. Marxism says history is made by matter and motion. That's what guides history towards communism, which is similar to primitive communism that existed at the time when everybody, everything was owned in common by cavemen. But that's not true. We don't know what they did. We don't know how they owned things back then. And how can matter be guiding history? Matter and motion is ridiculous. Most Christians believe history will end with the second coming, but there's no detailed explanation of exactly how God is working in history. Divine Principle explains because of the fall of man resulted from human failure, human failure to fulfill our portion of responsibility, God, after the fall, sought people he could work with to separate good from evil, to purge the evil satanic lineage. He used a consistent formula he used a consistent formula in history. That foundation for the Messiah has two parts. The foundation of faith, which symbolically restores the fall foundation of substance, which is the cain -Abel dynamic, as a substantial means to separate out fallen nature, which we acquired through the fall. God expanded this foundation for the Messiah through eight levels, individual, family, tribe, community, society, nation, world, and cosmos. So to fulfill his mission, the Messiah, to fulfill his mission, how to fulfill our portion of responsibility on all those levels, the Messiah has to know how God is working. He has to be somebody who knows that. I remember when we were in Chile, um, we went away, Nancy and I went away for a weekend, and when we came back, all the members had run away. I said, what happened? They said, well, this guy came. He said he was the Messiah, and he confused us. And I said, well, that's silly. Who was he? Well, we don't know. Where did he go? We don't know. 
we'll come back and we'll talk about it. So we talked about it and they all came back. And then uh, some weeks later, this guy showed up at the front gate because everything has a gate, you know, in, in Latin America. And he says, I, I, I need some copies of Divine Principle. And I had these two scruffy guys with him. And, and, and so something said to me inside my head, this is the guy who thinks he's the Messiah. I said, well, come on in, let's talk. And I gathered them. I said, come on, is this the guy? Have you met before? Yeah, yeah, this is the guy. Okay, great. I said, what's the fall of man? How did evil begin? I don't know. Well, how can you be the Messiah if you don't know that? Well, I, I, I am the Messiah. Well, how do you know? How can you save the world from sin if you don't even know what is the source of evil? How did it begin? He didn't know. So the Messiah has to know certain things. The spiritual experience was one thing which strongly convinced me because I had gone through this course of suffering in advance. But the divine principle confirmed that. You can't just go based on spiritual experience. You have to have a grounding in the truth. To fulfill his mission, the Messiah has to know how to restore these things. Jesus said in John 5, 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever he does, that the Son does likewise. Divine principle explains, I'm at two, Roman numeral two. Divine principle explains history based on dual scenarios, explaining what if man does fulfill his portion of responsibility, what happens when he does not fulfill his portion of responsibility. Most of the time, we did not fulfill our portion of responsibility. What if John the Baptist did become Jesus' chief disciple? All of history would have been different. John the Baptist had that much power, that much influence. He was that charismatic. He had the connections. He, had the, the, he was of the priestly class. So explained key points. And the fact that divine principle explains that, as, as Jim has pointed out, reveals that true father has to be somebody very different to understand the mind of God, what God is doing, what God is doing in history. If we are God's children, then God's omnipotence and omniscience have to be balanced by the gift God gave us of free will. So how do you balance those two? How do we define the important role for man's portion of responsibility as a co-creator with God? Nobody is going to reject Christ if he comes in a cloud with angels blowing trumpets. When I teach the conclusion, I say to people, probably Fidel Castro, he's dead now, but probably back in the day, if Fidel Castro saw Jesus come in a cloud with trumpets, don't you think he would run into the street, whip out his wallet, throw his card as a member of the Communist Party on the ground and say, Jesus, I always believed in you. I mean, that, that's, a, that's an easy, easy thing. The Messiah coming on a cloud. But Jesus said that in a... Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So there was a possibility people would not accept. People would not believe. If Christ's return is like the return of Elijah, divine principle explains, we have an example of a second coming. We've already had a second coming before in history. The second coming of Elijah in John the Baptist. Because we have our own portion of responsibility, the most important truths in the Bible are explained in metaphors, such as I am the vine and you are the branches. So Christ's return on metaphorical clouds, as it says in Hebrews 12.1, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. 2,000 years ago, Christ came with a physical body on earth, and he will come in the same way again. You can read through the rest. I just want to add one thing here. It was one thing theoretically, you know, divine principle, but when we met Father, when we experienced Father in person, this was, this was an amazing experience many of you here had and some of you have not had because you were born after he passed away or you just didn't have that experience. Through our experiences with Father, we... we we found him to be not only multifaceted, but extremely loving. 
I remember one experience I had with Father, which deeply touched me. I sat in the front row at Upshur House, almost directly in front of him, and the and the whole the whole time Father was speaking, you know, I, w- I was sitting here, and Father would be in front, and he kept coming up close, and he kept kicking my feet, <laughs> and I'd pull my feet further back, and I think I'm getting in his way. And somehow he'd reach under the, the, the chair and he'd kick my feet again. And I wasn't falling asleep. I thought, what is this? What, what's going on? Why, why is he doing this? Many of us had the experience of Father saying something in a speech and we would think, ah, oh, he's talking to me. And I, as, I, as I looked back on this experience for many, many years, I realized He was playing with me like a father with a child. And I needed that because I hadn't had that for my own father. And he perceived that in me and he filled that need. And I was father. He was always thinking, what can I do to help this person? What can I do to serve this person? What can I do to build this person's faith? And that's why I believe he's the Messiah. Thank you very much. I have these speakers trained so well. I told them they can only speak for 20 minutes, and they're just doing it. Anyway, thank you so much, Regis, for your beautiful testimony. Let's thank him again. Guess who our next speaker is? There he is. Let's welcome Gideon Rauchi. Hello, everyone. Oh, boy. Uh, I, I usually, I, I was just going to share something biblical, but it seems that King Regis and King Jim, they, they also share their personal testimony. So I might, you know what, like, how, how else can you describe Christ without a personal testimony, right? Like, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's the whole point. It should be personal. It should also be objective. It should also be, right, in a bigger picture, but also should be personal. Uh, you know, I'll give my personal testimony very quick. But um, when I was a young child, uh, although I was doing 100K with my family every day, uh, I had a lot of dreams from Father, and Father was guiding me. And there were times he saved my life. And, you know, when you're young, you're not really grateful. You're just like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> but then as time goes on and, I, and, and you get older, you realize this is really precious. So I never, you know, as a young person, I never questioned whether God exists or not. Because, you know, I would see patterns and, you know, I had dreams and they just come true. Uh, so my challenge wasn't exactly a spiritual experience. It was seeing things come physical. Right, So it's kind of the opposite. While someone would be like, I want to have a spiritual experience, for me, it's like, I want to see something physical happen. So it confirms the spiritual experience that I had. Does that make sense? So so, uh, long story short, when I came to fully understand, not, not exactly fully, but in heart, who True Father is, I was basically 18 years old. I went through five years of conditioning to loving my enemy who wanted to basically hurt me, right? And I acted upon myself like how father was in Hungnam prison for two years and eight months uh, in, in a gulag that he still committed in loving his enemy, right? Even to the point of loving Kim Il-sung who wanted to put him in prison and get him dead, right? Uh, so I made that condition for myself and I had the, you know, I, again, I had spiritual experiences of true father before, but it's just like, oh, that's nice. But finally, when it came to this point, after making these serious conditions I've made, that's when I actually experienced his heart towards me. And he called me his son. And the feeling of love that I had that's very unique that I never even had from my own parents, which by the way, my parents are great. They die for me. But father, the feeling that I had from him was that his love was forever. That's, all, that's how I could describe it. It's like this forever love. 
So when I came to understand that as I read the Bible, as I got older, uh, I actually have more of a connection with Jesus. Like, wow, wait a minute. I can understand Jesus more from the experiences I have with father. And when Jesus died on the cross for every man's sin in which the wages of sin is death, right? That he has tasted death for everybody. And he was in hell, even though he's in there for three days. Uh, the feeling is eternal, but he did that because he loves us forever, eternally. So I realized that's the love that father had for me. That's why I had that's what I felt. That's what it was. So, uh, and throughout these dreams and experiences, father has promised me, he said, my son, you will, your children will become leaders in this world. They'll, they'll become world leaders in this world. And I didn't understand why, but now that, you know, I'm here, I'm with sanctuary church. I loved how second King has elaborated on the kingdom, the kingdom aspects, being a tribal King and so forth. I realized, Oh, because the basis of where I'm at, I could teach this to my children and they'll have a greater understanding, eventually become greater kings than me, but ultimately centered on Christ's teachings. Amen. So, so now I, let me get to the physical aspect of, you know what, again, things are physical. Father has done these things. Okay. So testifying to true father. Now, just like what the, the Israelites have been through, Jesus' disciples, they had debates with the Pharisees, okay? And about, you know, who Jesus is. And the Pharisees would be like, well, if he's the Messiah, then where's Elijah, right? They needed to see that guy. That was the one biggest sign, right? Where's Elijah? So, so Jesus' disciples were like, oh man, who, who is, wait, yeah, who is this Elijah? You know, some were illiterate, some weren't that educated, some were educated, they knew about Elijah, but they came to Jesus, they're like, hey, um, look, we know that you're the Messiah, basically. We know that you're the Christ, but who, who, who is this Elijah? Like, we, we don't, you know, we didn't see him. And Elijah basically said to him, oh, yeah, those Pharisee guys, they're right. Elijah should come first. And as he ex described, then in the end, as you can see here, it says, then the disciples understood that he spoke of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the Elijah to come. And a lot of people didn't know that. Right? So who is that person that we need to see before the second coming of Christ? Who's that guy? Hmm. Well, you guys know who that guy is? It's the bam antichrist, the man of sin, right? The man of sin. So what does it say here? It says, now we beseech you brethren by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering to, together unto him, the second coming of the Lord. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come, shall not come. The second coming of Christ shall not come except there comes a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the antichrist is the one who comes first before the Messiah, right? So if we, you know, if we try to, you know, uh, to say, look, second, uh, second coming of Christ is already here. Same as Reverend Simon Moon. It's like, oh, well, if that's the second coming of Christ, then, well, who's the Antichrist? That's a great question. That's, that's legitimate. That's a legitimate question, right? So let's check out more of how it describes about the Antichrist, the beast, right? It makes it sound like it's Godzilla, right? Coming out or Mothra or, you know, Ghidorah or whatever, right? Let's see these traits, of what the Bible says. It says, and stood upon the beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his head, the name of blasphemy. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life. Wow. Okay. Have we seen this beast before? I, I didn't see any beasts coming out of the sea yet. Right. I know second King has talked about this in this congregation. Right. But here's the thing. When you look at these traits, right now, just, just remember those traits, remember those traits. So just like with Elijah, right. Who was this great, powerful prophet at the time, 
who was filled with such Holy Spirit, John the Baptist is the same. He was filled with that Holy Spirit. And a matter of fact, okay, uh, matter of fact, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, the angel Gabriel went to his father, Zechariah, and said, look, and he shall go before him, before uh, Jesus, in the spirit and power of Elisha to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Right? So that was John's mission, to make ready people for, for Jesus. Well, the beast and the Antichrist, actually, some of the traits that you see that, you see it in actually today's society. We do already have a centralized world government. We do. We got world government. Wait, but I thought every nation has its own nation. Okay, do you look at everyone's federal banks? Every nation almost has the same federal bank that's owned by the Federal Reserves. Well, guess who owns that Federal Reserve? Well, we're going to learn about that later. But, I mean, imagine, right, we, we experienced this whole pandemic of the coronavirus, right? It's not just our nation. It's South Korea. It's, you know, China. It's... And a lot of countries from Europe are everyone's just wearing a mask. Wow. Every, you know, okay, let's, let's go on the list. Uh, let's say the military uh, industrial complex, Revelations chapter 13, 4. It says, who can beat this beast, right? Sad to say, now, look, God bless our troops. I, I, I'm not against the troops for their heart and dedication. But it's not natural for our soldiers to just be everywhere policing <laughs> every nation is not it, it's not that natural uh right matthew uh same thing with matthew chapter 24 verse 7 uh world religion revelations chapter 13 8 we kind of do have a world religion it's called the catholic church a lot of catholics right and what does catholicism always preach centralized government centralized government right what about Mark of the Beast, Revelations 13, 16, when you have on the head and the, the hand, right? So, uh, again, think, think about the coronavirus, all right? So, this is kind of like conditioning almost, where it's like when we're wearing these masks, oh, you can't, you can't go and buy in the store without a mask, right? Right? We're kind of experiencing that. Now, now imagine when the Mark of the Beast comes, now, you really can't buy and sell. This is where farming comes in, right, everybody? <laughs> All right. But anyway, so that's, that's where it says in uh, Revelation chapter 13, 17, that you can only buy and sell with the mark of the beast, right? We're seeing that. We're seeing that nature of this centralized government, which is essentially communism, which is what Father has preached against. This is the nature of communism. This is the Antichrist system. Right? It's so strong. It's like a beast. You can't, you can't destroy it alone. Right? You can't destroy it alone. That's why when Christ come, which he already did, it's a people with Christ, kings and queens, tribes, that destroy that beast, that don't need to have give and take with that beast. The beast can only die, really, if it doesn't have give and take with people. Right? So... To describe more about the Antichrist, right, or the central world government. Now, I, I don't mean to just, you know, I know that we're warring against spirit and flesh. I get it, and that's awesome. The thing is, the Bible says this, and it's bound to happen. Someone's bound to do it, okay? God's word is there. Someone's bound to act out this part, all right? Is that, what, we, what do we get to see here? Uh, this is something Second King has talked about about the Antichrist system. We see the, about the four horsemen, right? In Revelations chapter 6, verse 2, and Revelations 2, verse 9, right? This is describing, well, who kind of fits this? It looks like, it seems like, the Rothschilds, okay, who own the federal banks, okay? Where it says the crowns and arrows, in Rothschilds and their symbols, they have crowns and arrows. Uh, on, on their symbol, on their... The red symbol, this is on the top, okay? It, it shows uh, like, kind of like a holy orb, right? It's saying that they are the anointed ones of God. When you get to see inside those two birds, it shows a white horse. Well, that's the thing. Out of the four horsemen, one of them is a white horse. So Rothschilds are depicting themselves as 
a white horse. All right. Um, it says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, that they're, they call themselves Jews, but they're not actually Jews. They're not Torah-believing, you know, the prophets-believing Jews. No, these are the synagogue of Satan. This ain't anti-Semitism, by the way, everybody. These, these, these people are not real Jews. All right, so the Rothschilds are fake Jews that pose as Jews. And the thing is, they are of the white horse. Well, what about in Revelation chapter 6, verse 4? We see with China, they're called the red horse. That they are powerful and they were given power by the Rothschilds. Where do you think communism came from, everybody? Guys, communism came from, well, Marx. Okay, Marx was also, he, he's, he's, a, he's a fake Jew. He's not a real Jew. He's a fake Jew. And that's the thing is that with these Rothschilds, they like to spread communism. So actually, a lot, if you know about the, the, the history of what happened with China, they had a lot of give and take with the banks in which they brought out that communism to then China to inherit and dominate the, the, the Republic of China and take over. So we're given power. Also, what it says in Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, when it talks about the jihadis, right? Not, not every Muslim believing person is a bad person, obviously, but these are the jihadis, all right? And it says that they were also given unto power, okay? They were also given unto power, all right? And they're, they're, they're about killing the infidels, right? Very violent people. Again, these are just the jihadis, not all Muslims. I'm not, I'm not banging on all Muslims. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 5, pair of balances, right? This is of the FBI, the CIA, right? All you Trump supporters are going to get arrested soon, right? Because you went to the, we went to uh, the, the, the insurrection at the Capitol, right? Right. Is that fair? No, it's not fair, right? It's quite the inversion of it, right? So this is something that we see. They all work together. And in the top, you see that the royalty, the royalty of like the British family, right? High, high power. High, there's a Netflix show about it. Actually, it's kind of educational if you want to learn more about Satan, about uh, the, the British royal family. It's amazing how they show off saying that they're the chosen people of God and everyone's like, okay, whatever, it's a show. It's like, dude, this is whack. Anyway, and then, oh, I'm sorry. And then uh, the priestly class, right? Again, the, the, uh, under the Pope, right? It's kind of like their false priest, okay? Uh, and if you learn about more about Catholicism, it's not exactly Christianity. It's actually more Babylonian. If you if you see a, you know, like like the priest not getting married. No, that's from a Babylonian culture of their false priest not getting married. Okay, oh, a certain way that where they wear the big fish hat. That's uh, that's worshiping the god Dagon, which is essentially Lucifer. It's not actually God Himself, God the Father. Okay, so we see all these things. It's just like what is described about the beast, the ten horns and all. It's, it's, it's this big orchestrated thing that just works together. And it's very difficult to stop if you're just one person. It, it's, it's almost, yeah, it's like impossible. So here's the thing. If we know that, look, our world is, is, is kind of getting united with this unholy alliance, right? This isn't just at some tribal level, some national level. No, there's a world level. And that's what it says in the Bible, that the world, the world's going to be taken over by this. And then the second coming comes. Well, guess what? Now, now that we've seen, okay, yeah, they, it, like every nation has a federalized bank by the Rothschilds. So many, so many nations are, 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 uh, are you know, adopt. Catholicism in a more like a, how do you say, centralized way. Uh, what else? Oh, we basically have like a military like in every nation, okay? Again, God bless our troops. I love our troops. I love their heart. Um, and, uh, and so forth. So now we then have to take seriously, you know what? Maybe the second coming of Christ already did come. So that's it. When the federalized banks have really spread out, that was in 1913. There is World War I. There's already wars of one nation upon another nation. Okay, that says that in Revelations. So guess what? Yes, the Messiah has come after that. He was born 1920. 
His name is Reverend Sun Myung Moon, second coming of Christ. And what are some attributes that he has actually already done in this lifetime, right? He's shown himself to be the kings of kings, Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, that he is the king of kings. Heck, he got, he got crowned by one of the congressmen over at the Capitol. Crazy. I mean, crazy how they pull that off is amazing. Uh, he calls himself true father. Well, guess what it says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, everlasting father. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. T you got two minute this? warning. Thank two you. Thank warning. you. Awesome. Right. He's ca called the everlasting father. Right. Why? Because even though we have God, the father, we also have Jesus, who not only is his son, but he should also he's also the original ancestor of everyone. True father is the original ancestor of everyone. OK, he is the second coming of Christ. He's a judge. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. He's a judge. He has judged people. He's called George Bush the prince of Satan. My goodness. And George Bush, he's, he's basically owned by the banks and the Rockefeller and the Rothschilds. So for him to say that to George Bush, he's saying that to all the federalized banks out there. He's saying that through George Bush. He's their puppet. Okay? He has won over communism. He, he, it, like, it, there's a video of him judging Kim Il-sung's leaders with, with unarmed over at North Korea. And he's judging them, saying that your ideology is horrible. It kills people. You have to adopt my ideology. He said that right to their face. And my, my, uh, my dad's spiritual father's mother was there. And she's like, we're all dead. <laughs> but... Didn't happen, and Kim Il-sung was happy. He's like, man, this guy's a real man. I like him. And he won over the hearts of communists, right? So, uh, and then he is the marriage of the lamb, right? So there's the bride of Christ. It's, think, just like what it says, that uh, the Lord's prayer, that, that the he like uh, the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? Kingdom of heaven as on earth, right? Things are made physical. So the bride of Christ is not only the church, Right? It's also that one person who marries the Messiah, just like how Adam, Adam was supposed to be the tree of life, and Eve, a physical person, was supposed to get married to Adam. Hence, therefore, there has to be a physical bride with the Messiah. So, long story short, uh, uh, we know that the, just like what Rishi said about the, the clouds, right? The Messiah coming from the clouds. But hey, it does say in the Bible that he'd come as a thief in the night. But in Thessalonians, it says that if you recognize him, if you're children of light, you'll recognize him. He's going to be born of a woman. It says that right in the Bible. And it says that he would have a white stone with a new name, a new name. And that person's going to be given that white stone. What's that white stone? It is the spirit of Christ itself. That he will have crowns, a new name on his crown, and also have a new song in which we already have. It's called The Blessing of Glory. Is that time? All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gideon. Well, you gave us a lot to think about. <laughs> okay, let's give another round of applause for Gideon and our, and our first three speakers. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're having a 10-minute break and over here we hope you have some questions um, please uh, write down your questions and we will start our next session with all of our speakers up here on the stage and we'll have some give and take